We welcome you to the Priscilla R. Tyson Cultural Arts Center for our conversations and coffee on this fourth day of the month of April. Mother Nature has been having fun with us, hmm? extending April Fool's Day with her April showers, blustery winds, winter snow. Hmm? <laughs> so glad you all weathered it and you're with us today. I'm Ellen O'Shaughnessy, coordinator of the Conversations and Coffee. We're delighted to have with us Gracie Morbritzer, who shares with us, inspires us through her most creative expression of art as an iconographer. Several people are saying, what is iconography? Hmm? It's a branch of art history that studies the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images, icon, the Greek word for image, and graphic meaning to write or to draw. Beauty surrounds us, Gracie, through these graphic images. Gracie was born in San Francisco, and she is likely one of these saints, huh? <laughs> modern saints, as you call us to this amazing creative family. She's always been drawn to the arts, storytelling and crafting curated experiences. Gracie shares that she grew up always experimenting with her dad's watercolor and going above and beyond with school projects. She spent time with her mom dreaming up stories. In school, she volunteered to create theater sets, even directing an entire play in the sixth grade. And she wrote countless short stories during her free time at recesses. When home computers became more accessible, she committed herself to making fun movies and editing photography. By the time high school arrived, Gracie began to realize that other students were often more talented than she was. But living creatively was all she knew, and she wanted to take a risk. And she applied to the Columbus College of Art and Design. There she spent four years in the interior architecture and design program, studying museums, set design, and immersive experiences. Gracie worked for and designed projects for the Ohio History Connection, COSI, Easton Town Center, and more. While at CCAD and what happened then? She developed her series, The Modern Saints, as a side project while attending classes. She graduated in 2020 with the honor of outstanding senior in her program and class year. What a moment, huh? What a time. The Modern Saints is a project that was born out of Gracie's transition from Catholic education to CCAD. As a student in a Catholic school, she'd always loved projects about the saints and re began to realize, as time went on, why? With each saint being from such a different place and time, but she noticed this. With these saints with different skills, passions, and life stories, learning about a new saint was always a window into a new type of way to be a person, a person of faith, a new way to look at religion, and a source of hope to know that someone has gone through every type of struggle and joy before her. She admired the courage for social justice that these saints all seem to possess. This project was the best intersection she could find that would allow her to create, research, and tell stories and all about something she was currently grappling with, well, she had so much to care about. The saints is her inspiration in learning about and choosing to break some of the rules of traditional iconography. Gracie's decided to center her focus on making the saints look more like us. 
so that we can realize how much they were like us. And so, in turn, we know that we can be saints just like them. She gives each saint a real human expression and sense of 21st century while making sure that their ages, skin tones, facial features are more accurate to how they would have actually looked. She hopes that these images can lead changed ideas and perspectives about who these people were and what it takes to be a saint. Gracie aims to bring these saints to all of us in their ways of love and service. In the summer of 2021, Gracie decided to leave her job to pursue full-time the modern saints. And so, you started a business and now has a studio at 400 West Rich Street in Franklinton. In December of 2023, her first book, The Modern Saints, Portraits and Reflections on the Saints, was released. It's a collection of 52 of her icons accompanied by reflections from contemporary authors on why the saints depicted are still relevant today. Well, I was delightful to hear Eric Murphy when I went into the class to make the announcement. He said, oh, I bought her book. <laughs> Gracie's speaking engagements all over the country have been pub and have been published in many articles. So the speeching, your speeches, have been published. Wow. And the interviews about your work have been published. Gracie. May the saints come marching in with us. <laughs> and we are delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. OK. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming in today. I really am excited to be here to talk a little bit about my project and also about what icons are. Um, so I give presentations about this project that I do, but I've also given presentations before about the history and all of the rules behind iconography. So does anyone have an idea of what an icon is or what makes it sort of separate from regular artwork or sort of makes it a little bit different? Yeah. I just always thought it was religious, not uh -huh. one, and that they were dubbed a saint in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I do stick to those rules, but there's a lot of other really specific rules and a really long history behind this practice as well. So I'll get into that a little bit um, to sort of explain how this project came about and what makes that different and what about it's the same. Okay. Um, so a little bit about me. I live here in Columbus. I have my studio at 400. Um, I actually got married in September, and I have a cat named Tater Tot. There he is. <laughs> he's my good luck charm, so he's in all my presentations. So I began this project in 2016, and in 2021, um, as Ellen mentioned, I transitioned into doing this full time. And I didn't have a studio at that point. Um, I was really just working out of my living room in my small apartment. And for the most part, that's still what I do, but just with a little bit more space. So it's just me. Um, in my free time, aside from working on this project, I do more art. I travel. Um, I still work on some projects for interior architecture and then research and museum design. Um, I also grew up in the Catholic school system, and that's what inspired a lot of this, um, a lot of this project. Um, it was really my whole world for the whole time that I grew up, all through high school until I got to college. And that transition is really what inspired this project. So a little bit about icons. I think the best definition to describe what they are um, that makes them different from regular art is that they are not made for beauty or just to adorn a wall, just to make a space more beautiful, um, but they're made for meditation, for contemplation. So the person that's depicted, the image that's depicted, um, is meant to be sat with, and you come up with new ideas while you're looking at it. They're also considered the visual equivalent of written learning or Bible stories, so they were used to educate people for a long time before literacy became more widespread. Um, and then also, they are also described as being written rather than painted. You might hear this interesting 
turn of phrase, and that's mostly because it is this visual equivalent of a written story. And then also there's a few language translations as well in there that make it that way. Um, and then the person portrayed is portrayed mystically. <laughs> so that means they're portrayed as they would look if they're in heaven. And that's really what, again, sets icons apart from regular artwork or more of a just biographical painting of exactly what a person would have looked like. And I'll go over some of the rules that make it this way um, on the next few slides. And then lastly, the process for creating an icon is also very strict and contemplative. So the artist that creates this icon uh, is really putting themselves in a separate space from the rest of the world and really taking their time and doing research to work on this piece. Some of the termino terminology and culture behind icons, there's a really long list that I could go through, but here are just a few of the most basic and important parts. Um, I mentioned how icons are written rather than painted. The first icons were also supposedly divinely created. So the reason why every icon is supposed to be based off of an icon that came before it is because the first icons were supposedly something that appeared out of heaven, not something that humans created. And so really, each icon that's created afterwards is supposed to be still that same image of the divine. The uh, imagery in icons and the way that they were painted was also really inspired by Greek and Roman funerary art. So it didn't come out of nowhere. It was very much inspired by the place and culture that it came out of. And then along with that, a lot of these first icons were found in secret ch chapels and catacombs since Christianity was still illegal at the time that it first popped up around in the Greek and Roman Empire. And because of that, a lot of symbolism that's actually used um, in early Christian artwork and icons had double meanings. So some of the anchors, for example, um, not only would be uh, symbolic of Jesus and fishing and the, uh, the apostles, but also uh, for Greek and Roman gods that had symbols of anchors. So that if these artworks were found, if these chapels were found, they might not um, get <laughs> raided or taken over because it could mean something else um, for the more dominant culture. Tell us about this icon. Yeah, it's wonderful. so this one is St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, he was known for um, not being super smart or super fast when he was in school, which is just hilarious because he became one of the most well-known authors uh, later in life, is very famous for his work. Um, but he was also very shy, and I tried to encapsulate that in his expression here. He also has a sun symbol that he's usually associated with for the enlightenment that comes from uh, his work that he gave to the world. There's a street named after him in Paris. Oh, really? And I walked down it. I mm -hmm. loved it. <laughs> uh, because the students that he had mm -hmm. would line up outside where he was teaching mm -hmm. because they loved the said contra. He always brought up what it would be that would object to the principal, and they all got involved in it. Uh -huh. I love it. I love what you've done here. Thank you, yeah. He, yeah, yeah, so uh, some of his most favorite, most cherished, vir cherished virtues were things such as strength and fortitude and resilience, and that is a flower, I believe it's a valerian is the name of it, that is supposed to represent all of those things. So some of the symbols that I use, um, as you'll find throughout the presentation, are representative of something that has to do with the saint's life or something that they were known for, or something that they were really good at, um, something that had to do with their story. Um, well, yeah. It's wonderful because he referred to his work as he was dying as nothing but a bunch of straw. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how beautiful it is that you brought those flowers forward, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that was actually a commission uh, for a church in Wisconsin, and I visited there. Uh, last winter, so that was great. Um, yeah. Um, and then lastly, the last thing about icons in their terminology and culture that's good to know is that the there were a specific set of rules that are followed sort of universally since about the 11th century, um, before that time period with Christianity still being illegal in a lot of places, and with uh, people within the church also believing icons to be um, 
I guess, idols and something that people were worshiping rather than just contemplating, a lot of icons were really destroyed before this time. So around the 11th century, um, things were able to even out, and any icon that you can picture in your mind sort of comes from that set of rules, since we don't have much left over from before that. Would you elaborate a minute on what it means that they're written rather than painted? Yeah, so it's... Everybody um, hear that? Yeah about writ um, icons being written rather than painted. So this sort of refers to the idea of these being visual stories or visual histories of a person. Um, and it also comes from, in a lot of the Eastern cultures that still create icons, their word for painting icons is a lot more similar to the English word for writing. So it's really for both of those reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So the design of icons is um, something that I was referring to with these set rules that showed up around the 11th century. Uh, most people within traditional icons that you see are very androgynous, unrealistic, and have impersonal faces. Again, this is to show them as they would look in heaven, as these original artists who established these practices would believe someone would look if they were in heaven. And the basics here is that they're purified and simplified. So this is why they don't really have any facial expressions. They don't look different from each other. Their facial features are all the same. And then, as I mentioned, I also must be a basic copy of another icon to go back to this idea that they're all from these divine images. And then something that I really love about icons, too, is that a lot of them have really immense or like piercing eyes. And this is because it's from the idea of they also are looking at you. <laughs> you also are looking at them, and they're looking at you. So you're seeing yourself being seen um, by this icon. And that's another way to get into this contemplation. And gold is also a really important color in icons. It is, in a lot of traditional pieces, gold leaf um, or metallic paints. And this is so that the icon be, could be described as illuminated. So light actually comes through it. Um, the paints that are used in icons also are very thin layers that light can easily penetrate. Um, and this is to give another otherworldly quality to these paintings as well. It also represents heaven, light, and life. Does it matter if they're looking at, so out, or over? Yeah, so traditional icons, they're pretty much always looking right at you. Two <laughs> well, of those are not. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, I'll explain a little bit about some of my reasons of keeping, deciding to not exactly adhere to some of the rules of traditional icons. But in traditional ones, they pretty much always are looking right at you. The only uh, difference is sometimes um, in images of Mary with baby Jesus, they'll be looking at each other, which I think is really special also. And what about this saint here? Yes, this is um, St. Anthony of the Desert, who was known to have really intense visions of like battling demons in the desert. Um, but something that's really special about him is that he has a long history of being depicted by a lot of famous artists. Um, Dali has a really famous painting of him. Um, in which he's battling these demons, and they're represented here in the designs on his sweatshirt. Um, he was also a really famous saint in the Middle Ages because there were a group of brothers who would take care of people who had uh, diseases, and they would walk around through the streets um, wearing these hoods and ringing bells and taking care of pigs, actually. <laughs> so um, all of those things are represented in the designs of his um, clothing as well. And then he was also known to have a staff, and so um, that's where the cane comes from that he's holding as well. He's also a patron of skin diseases. So um, I represented that in the vitiligo that he has here. And then all of the colors also come from traditional icons of him. So with a lot of these, I try to keep some of the same poses and colors as traditional icons would have, um, just to keep with the tradition and then also have it be recognizable to someone who might know a lot of these traditional icons, um, be able to pick out who that saint might be just based on those poses and symbols. So then there's also a specific process to creating traditional icons as well. Um, it's not just in the design, but also how these um, icons are actually created. So the artist first starts by preparing and receiving a blessing from whoever was in charge. Usually it was a monk in a monastery um, for most of history. And they would also be assigned what 
saint they were going to paint or what image they were going to create. Um, it's never something that's just their free choice. <laughs> so they also mix the paints themselves, and the paints are all made of earth elements. So there's minerals, plant material, animal material, um, that all has to be mixed together in the traditional egg tempera that they would use. And this was also meant to be an offering of those things as well, which I think is really cool um, as part of the process. Do the first one, did you have to receive a blessing in order to do the <laughs> Yeah, so I didn't because I don't do the traditional version, but I do take assignments usually because pretty much every piece that I do is a commission of some sort or a request of some sort. Um, so I do try to stick to that at least. Yeah. Blessed Mother and Jesus? It is. So I have a bunch of versions of her since there are so many titles for her, so many different ways that people like to think of her. Um, this one is her title of Our Lady of Peace. So she's able to hold um, her baby safely and has a olive branch for peace. Um, she also has a traditional uh, white material for surrender, peace, safety, um, and then a headpiece that looks like the rays of light from a halo too. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh? Is most things that you paint that size? About that, yeah. And that's because all of the pieces that I use are repurposed wood. So it's something that I've found somewhere that's been discarded, had a previous life. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that, but uh, this is definitely the general size that I stick with. I have done a larger mural um, that was several feet, but that's the largest I've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the um, process of creating icons as well is supposed to be meditative and always developing towards something a little bit different. So you're not really supposed to stay super stagnant in what you're doing, but keep creating on your process. Um, and then part of it being meditative is um, really almost using the process as a prayer as well. So not only is the image itself used for prayer, but the creation processes as well. And then when they're finished, they can still be used as a method of teaching, of telling stories, of explaining something about this person, but they are also used for contemplation, as I mentioned. And then spaces that house icons use incense and candles for veneration. Yeah, so that's, I guess, the best way of putting that is to um, honor it. So not only spending that time in contemplation, but making sure that it is um, respected as a piece of art. Yeah. Your use of color is wonderful. Who Thank were you. some of your professors at CCAD? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I actually didn't take any painting classes while I was at CCAD. Okay. <laughs> Color. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I think that actually comes from some of my um, interior architecture classes, though, because we spent so much time on making sure that um, spaces and experiences have certain moods and feels. And so I think that's mostly where it came from. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you'd say President Kanzani, because we oh, had him for quite. conversations <laughs> and coffee, and he emphasized color. It's and still a big part of the his school. his disciple, <laughs> even though you didn't take his class. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> well, his influence is still being heard there, that's for sure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. What color do you like? What, what color do you like working with? You know, I, I oh. like that blue back uh -huh. here. Like Thank you. Feeling. Uh -huh. Well, that's what I try to go for for each of these icons, is I really try to understand who this person was, uh, what their story is, what kind of energy they might have had, and who that reminds me of in the current day. And then I try to pick colors that are representative of, of that. Sometimes it's representative of the place they lived. So I just finished a saint that lived on the coast of Wales, and I picked a bunch of grays and greens and ocean colors. Um, yeah, so it really depends on the person, I would say. Do you, do you, do you notice certain cultures use certain colors and how mm -hmm. bright they are? Oh, some, some cultures, it's kind of kind of dead. Oh, definitely, yeah. And some colors are also just really important to certain times and places as well. Like maybe that it was, um, I just finished a, a commission of a saint who worked with the um, people of the Sahara Desert in the early 1800s, and they have an indigo dye that they use for all of their clothing. So that was a really important color for that piece. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so 
my project began, um, as mentioned, when I started college. Um, and I had found actually two discarded wood pieces that reminded me of what traditional icons used to be painted on um, in a free bin, of course. I was a broke college student, so there wasn't much else I could use for my art supplies. Um, and then I also wanted a way to try and work with uh, expressing what faith I still had from my Catholic upbringing and trying to figure out um, some new ideas that I had about it as well. So I wanted to create some icons for my dorm room. And uh, as I started these icons, I had no idea what sort of style I wanted to paint them in. I didn't know the history and the traditions behind traditional iconography yet. I didn't even know how to start or begin something like that. So as I was contemplating what sort of style I should do, I just left Jesus and what basically was a white t-shirt. <laughs> and the longer I sat with that, the more I realized that that was actually really impactful um, to see him look like someone that was just on campus with me, someone that I knew in, in the dorms. And so I decided to paint the second one as a St. Mary in a similar sort of modern way. Um, after that, I painted my patron St. Genevieve as a modern saint, and that was all I was going to do. <laughs> but commissions and requests started pouring in from a lot of my Catholic school friends who were really finding these relatable or something that was interesting to them. So I had to just sort of use it as a side project for a while, for many years while I was still in school. It was something I was really interested in. I love doing the research on all these people and figuring out who they were. I love storytelling and creating um, really portrait pieces and trying to come up with something new to say about each person with each one also. And I still graduated in interior architecture, but I was doing this on the side really all the way up until 2021, and that's when I decided to make it a full-time project. But a lot of this also was inspired by being a resident advisor when I was in school. So a lot of the students that I came into contact with and had to have some serious and deep conversations with had been really hurt by Christianity or had been even cast out of their homes by people in the name of Christianity, which is not the faith that I had known <laughs> or grown up with, but I knew it was very real and I knew it had done some serious damage um, for these people. So the more that I realized I could create these saints to sort of look like these students that I was talking with, because sometimes they reminded me of them too. They had very similar life stories, similar things had happened to them the more I realized that both sides, really, of the spectrum could get something new out of these pieces. So people who were still within the faith that maybe had uh, cast off or thought little of people who looked like my residents, like my students, um, could realize that maybe they'd been casting off saints or disregarding future saints. And then on the other hand, these people who had already been really hurt and had a lot of questions and things to figure out about their own faith, would be able to see that they could look like someone who is venerated now within the faith as well and realize that there's hope because um, people have gone through the same things that they're going through before and done it in a way that impacted their communities enough and changed the world in a good way enough to now be called a saint. Yeah. So where does tattoos come into play? <laughs> So that sort of comes from that idea um, in trying to realize that saints don't need to look the way that we assume they would look. Um, a lot of saints, if they were living in a time and place where they could get tattoos, I'm sure they would have <laughs> if we really think about who they were. Um, and then also just to change the idea of um, what kind of person you can be to be a saint as well, too. You don't have to be the type of person who wouldn't get a tattoo. So, yeah, it sort of goes both ways. Who did you say this oh. saint was? So this one is Saint Dismas, who is known saint as Dismas. the thief that was crucified um, on the other side of Jesus, who asked for forgiveness oh. as he was dying. So he's actually, fun fact, the first, the first saint and only saint that we know is for sure a saint because Jesus told him he would be in heaven with him. And so that's really when a saint is canonized, that's what we're saying. That's what the church hierarchy is saying is that this person is definitely in heaven. So if he said that, then that's what we know for sure. Um, yeah. And so he was known as being tied to his cross rather than nailed. So he has some sort of 
uh, ropes as the theme for his clothing, and then his tattoos come from his name meaning sunset, so symbols of that, as well as being known as someone who just lived in the desert. And so he has um, tattoos as well of some of the desert symbolism, and then the colors come from the desert as well. Yeah? You had mentioned your patron saint. Mm -hmm. Did you choose that, or do you find one that meets up with what you believe? Yeah, so the thing that I really love about Saints is that there's one that's a patron of anything you can think of. There's computer programming, basketball, ice skating, everything in the world. So uh, really, you can always find a saint for pretty much any intention that you have or anything that's important to you. Um, the patron that I chose was for a Catholic sacrament that you um, go through where you choose a saint that's important to you and you take their name as like a middle name, really, and they sort of become like your guide, I guess. And um, yeah, so mine was Genevieve. She was a really awesome leader in the French uh, Dark Ages who, even though she was a sister and started out as a farmer, um, she really was such a strong leader that she like rose in the ranks all the way to be friends with the king and made a lot of important decisions, uh, freed a lot of prisoners and helped the city with famine. So yeah, really cool. And who's the patron saint of uh, computers? <laughs> Actually, it's his feast day today. It's Saint Isidore. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. And also, I want to say Saint Jen the Falcon, who yes. oh, is so wonderful helping us with <laughs> and got all this set up. <laughs> and the computer. Uh -huh. yeah. But uh, tell us more about that saint. Two. Saint well, Isidore. We can talk more about Jen. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So he was actually um, the younger brother of uh, someone who became a saint later. I don't think he should be a saint because he was pretty mean to his younger brother. Um, but his older brother was really smart. He was in the church. He was a bishop, I believe. And Isidore had some learning disabilities. And he wasn't able to learn as quickly or as easily as his brother hoped he would. Um, he was really pushing him in a way that he couldn't go. Um, and he ran away from home because it got so bad at one point. And then he saw water dripping onto a rock and saw the erosion that had occurred there over so many years. And he realized that if he could take education and learning and the things he wanted to do in life as slowly and persistently as the water on the rock, then he could make as big changes as the water had on that rock over the years as well. So he eventually became Bishop of Seville when he was older, and he really created the city to be a center of learning and education. And he established so much communication with other cultures, other parts of the world. And because of that, the city really flourished. And it's only because of his perseverance that he was able to do that. Um, and so his uh, goal for education and for learning, for sharing with all over the world is what makes him patron of computers. So yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep, today, uh, yeah. Do an icon for him, you should have the motto, have you tried restarting? <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, this is, um, yeah, really how my project got started. I participated in art fairs, got involved in communities that were looking for art, and created my website. And that's really where it took off from. How many sites have you done? Over 150. <laughs> I don't have the exact count right now, but and a your bunch. Book, your book has how many? 52. 52. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And there are 20 of those weren't released yet when I put the book out. There's a few that have been. So, yeah. So part of the biggest issue that I needed to work on when I was developing this project was what about traditional iconography did I want to keep and what did I want to get rid of and why? So some of the things I decided to keep were having their names on the image. Uh, sometimes in traditional iconography, having their names on the image is almost described as um, conveying part of their spirit onto the image. So that makes it really special. I use the Greek dialect of um, Koine that is used on traditional Byzantine icons um, for their names in these pieces. Again, I'm not a scholar of that, but I do try as hard as I can to get the right translation. I keep solid color backgrounds to be able to focus more on the person that's being featured. Again, if this is for contemplation, that's the best way to do that. And it's also another way to pick a really important color that I think has something to do with their story or their energy. I do keep using wood bases. As I mentioned, they are repurposed wood. 
Um, I also keep some of the same poses that were used in traditional icons and some of the same symbols that are used to uh, describe who that person is. We mentioned how in traditional icons, they all look the same. They all, you can't really tell one person apart from another. So one of the ways that you could walk up to an icon and know which saint is depicted is by some of the symbols that are in that image. So for example, we mentioned Saint Anthony of the Desert um, walking around with pigs. So if there was a saint holding a pig, you might know that's Anthony of the Desert. And so that's something that I also try to do in my icons as well. Um, I also make it a contemplative and prayerful process. I pick a playlist for each saint based on something to do with their life, and I pick an outfit and maybe even a tea or a fun drink or something else that I can do to set up the space with a candle, some sort of scent, and really just make everything about this person. I immerse myself in research about them, everything they ever did, <laughs> follow all sorts of um, internet rabbit holes just to see anything related to them, modern interpretations of them, just so I really have a good idea of who this person was and who that might remind me of to use as a reference. Uh -huh. Is that part of your book then? A little bit, yeah. So I do describe, yeah, yeah. In, with each one I describe the process of the choices that I made for each part of the image as well, yeah. Uh -huh. So the circle of color or light that's uh -huh. behind the head or the person, is that the light that's coming through? Is yeah, that yeah, yeah. That? yeah, so this is the halos that are in each icon are meant to be, as I mentioned, the uh, illumination, the light that's supposed to be I guess, infused with each person. So that also shows that they are a canonized saint, that they are someone recognized um, by a community as someone who uh, was really a role model and someone to look up to and someone who did great things. So yeah, and each of my icons has those as well. Sometimes they're different colors. This one is St. Mary of the Desert, who was really interesting. She uh, was in the desert for 40 years, <laughs> supposedly, and um, a priest who was just wandering in the desert one day came across her and wanted to hear her story and how she got there. And um, it was really a really intense story about how uh, she wasn't living the way that she knew she wanted to be. She wasn't living in a great way. She was hurting a lot of people, and she tried to enter a temple at one point, and um, a mysterious force wouldn't let her in, and so she was trying to figure out what she needed to do to be able to go in, and she realized it was to change her life, and so she immediately did that and went off into the desert for 40 years. So, <laughs> yeah, really interesting. Yeah. When I was a child, I had a book of the Book of the Saints, mm -hmm. and I used to read, there was a page on the left that was a picture, and then there was the story of all these things. Yeah. And I don't know whatever happened to that. <laughs> well, I love those, the Saint Dictionaries, and that's... Saint, uh, uh, saint Inga. <laughs> Possibly you just interiorized that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's really what my book is based off of, though, is it's sort of a saint dictionary. So each page has an image of the saint that I've depicted, um, a little bit of bi biography about them, and then a contemporary author has written a reflection on why they're still um, that, uh, why they're still someone to look up to today, why they're still relevant. So it's really interesting. I've always loved saint dictionaries, too. So, yeah, that's where I got that from. <laughs> Um, let's see, so something else that I still do that's traditional for iconography is working in thin layers. I use really cheap acrylics, <laughs> so they don't come out very easily, and that helps me to focus more on the process and realize that it takes more time, more effort than it needs to. Um, and then the colors that I choose also have meaning. And then some of the things I decided to change from traditional iconography is, firstly, the expressionlessness. So I understand why they made that choice in traditional iconography to show almost that they had power over being able to withstand anything that can happen to you in life. But in my pieces, I really want them to look like real people who we can relate to. And one way to do that is to understand that they had every emotion, every feeling that we can have. And so expressing that in as many different emotions and expressions as possible in these pieces is one way that I can do that. And then another thing I knew I needed to change was the fact that a lot of traditional icons whitewash these saints and their facial expression or skin tones 
And this is partially because some monks who were creating these in the Dark Ages honestly had never left their monasteries, didn't know there were people out there who didn't look like them. Um, but another thing is that they wanted, sort of in the same way I do, to be able to relate to these saints. And so they wanted to make them look like them. Um, of course, in today's day and age, we know that that does a lot of harm, though. Um, changing what a person would have looked like um, when they lived, where they lived, changes their story and who they were, and that does them a real disservice because that's um, an integral piece of, of who they were and part of their whole story. Um, so yeah, that's something I knew I wanted to change. And then also giving them 21st century clothing <laughs> also comes from wanting to be able to relate to them. So if um, we are looking at traditional icons of people in all these flowing robes or even something as or far back as 1700s clothing, that's still not something that we feel like we can achieve. It's not something that we see people wearing. And it's easier to understand how you or a neighbor or a friend could be a saint if you see images of saints wearing things that you and your friend and your relatives wear. So it also gives them just a way to translate their story into our century as well. So when you read a lot of their stories, you realize how similar they are to us, but you just don't think about it because they were living in 700. <laughs> so the more that they look like us, the more you, we realize that's a universal theme and way of living as well. Something else I decided to get rid of was erasing imperfections. A lot of traditional icons, if the saint had a disability or some kind of injury, or even some sort of really noticeable facial feature, they wouldn't include it. Again, this is just to show that you know they're all perfect when they are in heaven. Um, but this isn't something that I thought was important because I wouldn't be able to understand for myself why those things would be imperfect um, even in the world. Um, if we're all created that way, then that's something that's perfect as it is. And so that's something I wanted to change as well. And then the last thing I wanted to change was automatically aging a lot of the saints. So we have plenty of imagery by now of the saints as older people, but the reality is that a lot of them didn't actually live to be very old <laughs> based on the time and place they lived in or they were killed really young. And plus, uh, the younger generations today need to be able to see themselves in these saints as well. They don't need to think that they need to wait to be a saint or they have to be much older and wiser to be able to do the thing that they want to do to change the world. I noticed you Which said. Is that one? This one? No. This one? So this one's Sister Thea Bowman, who actually uh, lived in the last century. So some of you may have heard of her. She actually passed away in 1988, I believe. Um, but she was a black Catholic sister who brought the music from her um, black Baptist um, upbringing into the Catholic Church and really advocated for uh, making things more equitable for um, black Americans within the church. And she actually became a huge leader within the church. And there's some really famous videos of her leading the entire um, conference of Catholic bishops in a song. And they're all singing and dancing. And she was really amazing, just full of life and energy. So my current process, I mentioned a little bit about this, but I always start with a commission request or a suggestion. Um, and then I spend days in research looking for reference images and following any path that stands out so that I can write the saint's biography first. Uh, we talk a lot about how icons are the written or the visual version of written learning. And so having that actual written piece first is something that really helps me with the process. I also create image boards on Pinterest, just tons and tons of images of anything that reminds me of the saint. Artwork from the time period, textiles from the time period, color palettes birds that live in the area they lived in, facial expressions, fashion, anything like that. And then as I mentioned, I choose a playlist, space, scent, or a certain type of atmosphere in which to create the piece. I engage in prayer meditation throughout. And I also decided to allow mistakes um, that make changes to how I pictured this icon originally looking. And this is because I, number one, never had formal training as an artist. So sometimes trying to get things to look exactly like I planned doesn't work out, just becomes frustrating. And I also like to see it as sort of just letting the creative spirit guide me in the process as well by just letting it be what it is. 
I like the green and the gold around. It really brings out the um, piece very nicely. Thank you. I appreciate and that. And the writing, uh, can you explain a little bit about the writing on the side? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so in each piece, the uh, Byzantine Greek uh, dialect of Koine that I mentioned, what usually it says is some sort of uh, praise. So, for example, hail, holy, or saint is the title. That's the first word. And then the second word is their name. So this one is Joseph, and this is in the Greek dialect. Yeah, I uh -huh. really like his T-shirt and how you did, did his um, shirt around the T-shirt. Uh -huh. Thank really you. Came out really nice. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, it's a carpenter. It is. <laughs> yep, hence the shirt. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then the last thing is, uh, as I mentioned, adding the saint's name for each part of the process. Having been in Nazareth a couple of times, I imagined Joseph uh -huh. cutting, getting that wood already, yep. and selling it <laughs> as. So many people do down the streets of Nazareth now. Exactly. And he would look like that. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. wonderful, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, that's how I hope to bring it all into the present day. That's great. Yeah, here's some examples of some of the pieces that you can see that I keep or change with traditional icons. So um, on the side of each is the traditional piece or traditional artwork that's related to the saint, and you can see the similarities and the differences. So for St. Agnes, she's always holding a sheep. She has that as well in the first one. St. Dennis, unfortunately, is a really dramatic, awful, gruesome story about his head being cut off, but then he picked it up and kept preaching for a while. Um, <laughs> A little too gruesome for my work. I don't think that I would walk out onto the street and see someone walking around with their head, so he's in a turtleneck instead. Same kind of pose, though. Um, and then St. Ignatius of Antioch, devoured by lions. Um, he has a lion pattern on his shirt as well. Um, St. Edmund was a British king. You can see that I kept the color palette really similar to the traditional uh, stained glasses that are of him. St. Christopher uh, carrying... Um, baby Jesus, he has that image of a child on his shirt and um, has a lot of hiking gear on, um, as he does sort of in the traditional version. And then St. Rose of Lima, um, who had um, really, I guess, what I would say is a specific uh, ascetic um, way of living where she was just very uh, thin and worked really hard, so you can see that in her uh, facial features and um, style as well. So many of the saints in churches are in stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about proposing Getting into that? stained glass? I would love that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. That'd be super fun. Building a new church uh -huh. and putting stained glass windows with me. Gracie motor yeah. sensors. <laughs> They're beautiful. Yeah. And here's some more examples. Um, St. Simon, color palette's the same, facial expression, a little bit the same. St. Veronica, who is known as having the imprint of Jesus' face on her veil, um, has that on her shirt there. Um, St. Sergius and Bacchus, um, always pictured together. Um, St. Hildegard has, is usually depicted with flames over her eyes to represent visions, but here she just has flame-colored eyeshadow. Um, Immaculate Heart of Mary, same color palettes. And then the myrrh bearers, um, uh, known as the women who discovered the empty tomb on Easter, um, are depicted here too. So what am I hoping to accomplish with this project? The first thing, as I've mentioned, is to show how much these saints uh, are just like us, and so we can be like them. We're all called to be saints by using the gifts that we have to make our world a better place. And so we have role models, and we want to become role models for the future generations. That's all our goals. So um, that's the main, the main theme. And as I mentioned, also to give hope and deeper reflection for those within and outside of the church to see where they may have... Um, just judged people too quickly or too harshly or just based on how they look, change all those perspectives. And then also it's to help realize the sometimes hidden diversity of artwork within the church. Since a lot of these icons are whitewashed, we don't realize that these saints actually came from all over the world um, from all different time periods and had all different skills and passions and things that they were interested in. 
And then in the same way, because when we realize that, we can realize some forgotten ideas and perspectives about the faith. So after so many years, of course, a lot of single stories have come down through the ages about one way to be a person of faith or one way to be a Christian or just what you need to think or be if you're within the faith as well. And when we study more about the saints and realize what they thought and what they believed, we can realize that they actually sometimes directly contradicted each other and what they believed. And so that gives us so much more freedom and hope for our own ideas um, when we can see someone who's come before us that has those same ideas. And then- I wanna, in uh the light of what you just said, coming from different viewpoints, different mm -hmm. backgrounds. Um, I'm inspired by the students I work with who are interfaith, mm -hmm. you know, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish. And just recently we had a prayer time where the Muslim student, Abdullah, and then Yahya got into it too, praying for the Jewish student, mm -hmm. now graduate, who was so apologetic about what's happening. And the Muslim student lifted his arms and prayed, do not be ashamed, you are beautiful. And I was so moved by that, that I would think that maybe uh, you could do an icon of Saint Abdullah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But the inter interfaith <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is so uh, present in your art. Thank you. Yeah, I really mm. hope so. And I hope that, that that shows how many different ideas and, and ways to be a really loving person yes, there are. I, I name those who don't name a particular denomination or mm -hmm. faith tradition as searchers. Mm -hmm. And um, they're right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, and I, I mentioned that the, all of the saints that I paint are uh, canonized within the, the Christian faith, uh, within all different branches. But what I would really hope, and I mean, I will never run out of those saints to paint as it is. So what I would hope is that someone else would be able to portray the saints of their own faith in the same way that I do, because I think that all different faith traditions need this. I just already have too much to work with, so I don't think I could ever get around to it. But I really hope someone would. Anthony become the patron saint of lost things? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, so it, what happened, I guess, was when he was the leader of a certain monastery that he was at, uh, one of the novices who was training to be a monk decided he wasn't ready to do it. He wasn't ready to commit, so he ran away from the monastery, and he took St. Anthony's favorite Bible with him when he did that. And this is the Dark Ages, so they didn't have printing press. Like, he had handwritten and hand-decorated this entire Bible himself, so he was really upset about it, hoping that not only would the Bible be brought back, but also the students, so that he could join the monastery and decide to be part of the community as well. So his prayers... Um, for that to happen actually came true and the student did come back with the Bible and decided to join the monastery. So um, it was the returning of something that had been lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a popular saint and I know why. It's definitely easy to lose things. <laughs> yeah. So um, where do you come up with the models? Do you have models or do you yeah. want to choose people that you know for the images? Yeah, so I've painted all of my roommates, <laughs> number one. Um, but most of the images actually are a combination of a lot of references. So sometimes they're people that that saint reminds me of. And then most of the references are people who live in the area now where that saint would have lived when they were on Earth. Uh -huh. You're bringing religion to be more relative to people. Yes, now. definitely. Thank you. Uh -huh. You know, this is a little bit off the sub subject, but I, I like how you got the um, card looking thing, you know, the paint, you know, it's very nice. And I, I just noticed it's all kind of like a, like a baseball card. Yeah, exactly. And wouldn't it be nice to have, make cards with the um, images that you're doing and then have the, the life thing yes. on I the I do back. have those. <laughs> I do actually. I do actually have them. Yeah. 
One for each of them. So you could actually have a whole trading collection of all my pieces. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to get um, off offline. No, that's a great question. I love that. And that is something that I have for that very reason, so that you can read about them on the back and then see the image on the front. Well, that's another way to contemplate. Not play, yeah. Yeah? yeah, exactly. I <laughs> but they can be. <laughs> they certainly can be. <laughs> yeah, who is this saint? So this one is Saint Cyprian. He was a bishop of North Africa during a time of a lot of um, Roman persecutions, famines, plagues, basically anything that could happen he had to deal with as leader of the community. So he's a really good example of servant leadership. He was just right there in the middle of his community taking care of people personally, um, even though he was the leader. So, yeah. Yeah, and then lastly, I just think that um, some of the reasons why those goals I mentioned on the previous slide are important are for a few reasons. And the first is because there's been a lot of university studies that the way that we picture people that we know are powerful and people that we know are good, such as for a lot of people, saints, God, Jesus, um, everyone in that realm, um, is the way that we will automatically picture, no matter who we are, the people who are good and powerful in our society. So if we only have images of white Jesus and white saints and white older male God, then we're going to automatically assume that those are the type of people in our society that should have power and that we see as good. And obviously that's super damaging and really not um, how we know things are and not what we want for our society today. So anything we can try to do to um, change up some of that imagery that we have all around us on a regular basis will help with uh, mitigating that. And then also the church in particular just has quite a history of a lot of harm. <laughs> so some of these images depict uh, what were originally saints that did a lot of colonizing, that built a lot of missions that were really terrible to indigenous people. And so deciding to um, not represent those people or not continue to venerate those people or honor those people is part of this, but also just being able to undo some of that colonization as well with making sure that these people are represented as they really were um, can help with that also. And then, of course, we can realize our own gifts and our own callings when we have role models of all these different types of people with so many different types of gifts and callings. It makes it a lot easier to realize what aspects of our lives we can use to create good change in our communities when we've seen someone who did it before. Even if it's something that you might not think might be something super useful. Um, St. Rose, as I mentioned in one of the last few slides, created a garden for her community. She just loved flowers and loved gardening, um, but when hard times came around, she also planted plenty of vegetables and that sustained them for a while, so you never know. Um, yeah, and then being able to find role models in history and in those around us is also important. So the more we can picture the people around us as saints, the more we can find role models in them too, and the more we can realize what good impact they've had on our lives and what we can do for theirs as well. And here's just a few <laughs> of my over 150 that I have. <laughs> Who's the young lady here on the end? No, down here in the picture. Down here. In the oh, picture. oh, oh. So this one's St. Faustina. Um, you may have seen the painting before that says, Jesus, I trust in you with the like light rays coming out of him. <laughs> She's the one who had that vision, yeah, and created that painting. Yeah. All right, and then we mentioned a little bit about my new book. Um, it just came out in December. So the write-up for it is that um, the portraits that I have, the icons that I have celebrate the diversity and spiritual depth of the different saints. And then they also have, as I mentioned, reflections from different writers about why that saint is still relevant today. Um, there's also like quick facts about when they were born, what they're patron of, everything like that. And so it's, you can use it sort of like the Saint Dictionary where you flip through and look at each one. Um, but it's also centered, it's also organized around when the Saint's feast day is or what kind of holiday is happening in the world. If you want to go through it as a week by week thing, more of a devotional to look, uh, have a theme for each week for the year. So yeah, and it's available from all major booksellers.
And here is my contact information if you're interested. Um, my website does have a mailing list. If you're interested, I put out at least one new icon every month, so it'll let you know if you're on the mailing list. Um, you can also email me if you have any questions um, or have any commission requests. Um, and then my Instagram is really fun. My Instagram and Facebook each day of the year uh, has certain feasts that um, are supposed to celebrate each saint. So really basically every day of the year you can celebrate a different saint based on that day. And so on my social media I post whichever saint's feast day it is and how you can celebrate it. So for example today for Saint Isidore you can do something good on the internet <laughs> or learn more about the internet today. For us today is the feast of <laughs> Saint Tracy. <laughs> <laughs>